So good. Now rock and roll. Yeah. So today I'm going to talk about analytical conversations, um, uh, which are um, use data to drive uh, progress on problems big and small. Uh, let me just adjust my Zoom window a little bit. There we go. Um, there are two types of conversations. Uh, the first kind is individuals with uh, have conversations with computers to understand data. And the more important kind is people having conversations with each other using data uh, to address problems. Um, yeah, the, during the talk, I'll introduce myself some more, uh, but the core, the core of the talk, sort of the, the meaty part of the talk is about how um, uh, encoding data visually uh, supports both types of conversations. So uh, I thought I would start by giving examples of, of big data problems, um, uh, the climate crisis, public health, uh, education, uh, uh, social injustice. Uh, these are really big problems um, that data is extremely relevant to. Uh, they're big enough that uh, you can absolutely believe that people need to have conversations with each other using data um, to even make progress at all on, on these sorts of problems. But even really small problems uh, can involve data and sometimes they can be sort of challenging. Like for example, here's a two by two multiplication problem. And the challenge with this one is that humans have limited short-term memory, which makes it really hard to keep the partial results in your head. Um, it, but humans have evolved to actually use the physical uh, world uh, to help them think. And in particular, you can, if you can jot down the partial results on a, on a uh, piece of paper, then you can work, work this simple, simple problem uh, uh, pretty, pretty well. Um, and in fact, if you measure people doing it, you can see that they uh, can work it like five times faster with pencil and paper. And that little bar chart there is an example of how uh, we can tap the power of the human visual system to help people work with data. Um, if I just put the, the raw, raw numbers down, you would have had to do mental math <laughs> to, to, uh, to see the five times increase. But your visual system can process that really well. So what that means is that it's really a a team sport to work with problems, particularly work with big problems. Um, and this is my picture of uh, es essentially what, what it takes for the, for the team to work with problems. Um, the ocean represents sort of the bulk of the people in the organization um, who uh, find data relevant to their work. They consume that data. They sometimes share it with each other. Um, they make decisions and they ultimately go off and act. The clouds represent the skilled people in organizations. Organizations always invest in, in people who are skilled in data uh, and they do t jobs like um, curate the data. They author um, data to nowadays, mostly da interactive dashboards uh, uh, to, to, to share with the organization. Uh, some of them are data scientists and they create models of one type or another um, the little little machines that uh, that uh, do do data related work, um, and then finally they they manage they manage the data uh, for the organization, and of course obviously there's this big water funnel in the middle, and that is uh, what I label that to be uh, is um, self service analysis. Um, and uh, it is self-service analysis that actually drives uh, this engine in, in organizations. Uh, nowadays, all organizations understand that there's more data than the skilled people in the organization can handle. Um, and what self-service analysis does is, first of all, the skilled people author uh, where people are consuming the data. So that's one connection. But the more interesting connection is that a person consuming data might see something in their data that uh, leads to a question. And then that drives them up, to, up towards self-service analysis. Um, obviously, if the, data, if the data question is uh, hard, they might actually have to reach out to so somebody skilled to work on it. Um, but that drives the whole, the, the whole engine around. And part of uh, 
uh, that is to um, uh, tap the power of the human visual system. Uh, you all instantly saw this lion in the grass, and that's because our remote ancestors uh, both, uh, you know, developed visual systems to see uh, dangers in the world and also to re to rapidly respond to the, to those dangers. And um, and that's that's uh, why um, visual techniques are so really useful for 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 working with data. And and I'll get into how how we encode data visually in a moment. But we uh, did um, uh, a lot of studies uh, when I was at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center of uh, various people working with data. And we developed a um, uh, high level uh, description of that data work, uh, which we now call the cycle of visual analysis. And this is the cycle of visual analysis where uh, it's up at the top here, you start with a task where data is relevant to it. And nowadays date, there's more and more data coming online. So it's almost every task data is relevant to it. You need to get the data. You need to choose a visual mapping. Um, you, you view the mapping, develop an insight and go off and act. Uh, when we studied people doing this though, we found out that it was a, a really rich, uh, complex backtracking process that, that is cognitively challenging. So you start with the task, you get the data, you uh, use your visual system to look at the data and uh, almost always you need to ad make adjustments to how you visually en encode the data. So you might backtrack to change that. Sometimes you look at your data and you realize you don't have the right data. So you, you go um, uh, either uh, change the data or sometimes you add additional data. Sometimes you look and you realize you, you thought you knew what your task was and you, and you change the, the question that you're asking. And even, if, even when you get to an insight and validate it, um, uh, almost always humans have to, uh, before they can act, they need to share, we see notice the share here, share the data with other people. Uh, and this is exactly where we're gonna get into the second kind of analytical conversation. That, that's where, uh, the conversations with data happen between people. So um, what I wanna do um, is to really get you to feel um, this cycle of visual analysis and, the, and, and sort of how it goes. And to do that, I'm gonna induce in you um, a, a little analytical task. And, I, and I, I found that even over Zoom, I can, I can do it the following way. What happens when one of these meets one of these if you're really, really lucky, you get one of these. And of course, this is when Captain Sully hit a flock of birds and was uh, able to successfully land his plane on the Hudson River, uh, even though his engines were out and all lives were saved. Um, and um, the, there was a lot of press about that. And the uh, natural question that I hope I've induced in you, uh, someday post pandemic, uh, we'll be able to start flying again. And, and the question is, is it safe to fly? Well, when the miracle on the Hudson happened, uh, somebody at Tableau went off and found out that the United States had a, a Federal Aviation Administration has a working group on wildlife strikes. And that working group has been uh, collecting reports from pilots about wildlife strikes. Um, this, is, this is the top sort of left corner of that data table. Um, and uh, it is just exactly typical data that people deal with. There's a date column, uh, there's um, string columns like airport and species and quantitative columns like height, height, and, height and speed. And of course the challenge is working with this raw data is first of all, there are a lot of rows here. And in fact, there are also a lot of columns here, here as well. So this is, um, this is pretty hard to deal with in, in, in its raw form. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, put that data in Tableau uh, to, uh, let me close that. Um, let me get rid of that. <laughs> um, and let me go to strikes. And so this is the strikes data here. Uh, and as I said, it had more columns than I, I showed you. There's information about aircraft, airport, um, you know, the conditions, the uh, effect, including amount of damage, 
loc location, the when and where, and then there are also a bunch of quantitative columns of one type or another. And Tableau, for those that haven't seen it, is that has is a simple drag and drop user experience. And in particular, if you drag out uh, the, the the strikes count field uh, and drop it on the column shelf, then uh, what you can see here is um, roughly 200 and 30,000 reports from pilots in this particular data set. Um, and for the particular question I hope I've induced in you, this amount of damage field here is the natural one to, to, uh, to drag out for that particular question. And when you do that, you split uh, that bar apart. And also I can drop the amount of damage on the color shelf. And what you see here is 71, almost 2000, reports uh, where the amount of damage is null. And what null means is the pilot didn't enter in any damage into the form. So probably no damage. 140,000 uh, none, all the way on down to um, 143 planes destroyed. And one of the cool things about having a lightweight user experience for um, you know exploring data is that little questions can pop into your head and you can go explore them. So if, for example, here's the cost field and it's really natural to wonder what's the relationship between the number of strikes and the, and the, and the cost. And you can do that by just dropping it on the column shelf and you get two columns. And um, uh, the, uh, uh, this is this is uh, the, the the count of strikes, and this is the cost, and there you you can see that they're inversely correlated, which isn't surprise. Well, um, you, even if you don't know what that what that phrase means, um, and you can also see that um, the 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 cost is growing, which is not surprising because uh, this is the amount of damage that's increasing here. But what was fairly surprising was the size of this orange bar, which you can see is um, ha over half a billion dollars. And so that alone tells you why, why the FAA uh, has a wildlife strike mitigation working group because you know, it it's clearly can be very expensive. Now on the question of whether it's safe to fly, you might think that just because there's only 143 planes destroyed that it's probably safe to fly and yes, it, uh, that's a reasonable conclusion, but it, it is actually a, a, when you have a lightweight tool uh, for working with data, it's good to continue to look for, for evidence, both confirmatory and, 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 and against whatever hypothesis you're curr currently working on. And so um, in particular, even in uh, grade school, we're taught what, where, when, why questions. And so th this is a natural way to go explore uh, data, data like this. Um, and so I'm gonna keep this bar chart, but um, we, we can go explore um, where question darn easy by dragging out origin state um, and, uh, and dropping it on the detail shelf. And, um, and then I can go pick up the the, the strikes field and drop it on the color shelf. And as I did this morning, I can also drop the origin country here and you'll see that Canadian pilots actually have reported to the United States FAA um, um, uh, wildlife strikes, uh, presumably when they were flying down in the States, states uh, area. Um, but the light blue color indicates not very many reports from there, but the dark blue color indicates that California, Texas, and Florida um, have had a fair number of reports. And these are very populous states, so it's not surprising. But the interesting thing is Colorado here. Um, Colorado is not a populous state, but yet it appears to be um, uh, have a fair number of reports because it's a little bit uh, dark blue. But what I'll tell you as a visualization expert is color is not a great way to look at quantitative data. And you can actually on your own discover that if you take the number of strikes and drop it on the size shelf, that size is a much better encoding. Um, so you can see, yeah, there's a pretty big cir circle here. And um, there, if you ponder this for a while and you know Colorado, first of all, you know that there are commercial flights that pass through Colorado on uh, between the two, the two coasts. And secondly, uh, there's bird migration along the 
the uh, eastern side of the Rockies. So there, there's a lot of birds in Colorado. Luckily, where I am, uh, Washington State, is, um, is, it doesn't have a lot, of, a lot of bird strikes. Anyway, we could dive down in here and do uh, more, more analysis, but I'm gonna go on to the when question. Uh, and for when question, it pretty much starts the same way, which is to drag out the uh, number of strikes and go find the flight date field here. And if you drop the flight date field on the column shelf, then you get this lovely um, trend line. And there's two things extremely salient about this trend line. First is it grows over two decades. That's one of the cool things about uh, vi visual encoding. You can see how much, what's the range of the data here. And the other thing is it drops in the final year. And if we were all together in the same room, I would ask you why. And you would tell me, and almost always somebody knows, well, this is aggregated data and the final year is incomplete. And, you, and if you have that as a hypothesis, you can go explore that pretty easily. You can drill down to quarter and change to month. And you can see, first of all, that there's more reports in the summertime than in the wintertime uh, for the first year. And if you drag all the way to the right, first of all, you can see all the years that's the same property, but the final year ends in September. And in fact, you can see that the previous couple of months, it takes, there's a lag in the reporting. There's a, they're, they're, the previous couple of months are not where they probably need to be. So, um, so this salient visual effect is uh, an incomplete year and notice that we have ex exclude filter on the tooltip, so I can just uh, ex exclude that from, from my further analysis. Now, there's this two decade long increase. And um, if we were all in the room same room together, um, I, I would hear two things very commonly about why. One would be more reporting and another would be more flights. And then I would sometimes probe and, and I can hear a funny one, which is more birds, but it's actually not funny because the climate crisis is actually reducing bird populations. Um, but the more reporting one, uh, you, you can validate that one pretty easily by drop, doing the same thing I did before, drop the amount of damage on, the, um, on, the, on, the, on color. And what you can see is that the null is going up, the none is going up, but the minor, medium, substantial, and destroyed are staying flat. In other words, where it matters, it's staying, it, it, the reporting has always happened, um, but where it didn't matter, the reporting has been increasing over time. And furthermore, there's this bump here. This was when the miracle on the Hudson happened and the, the, all the uh, national press, even international press, um, uh, led to US pilots, uh, you know, uh, reporting to the FAA that this bird bounced off their windshield. Um, now, uh, we can also go explore the more flights data uh, uh, as a possible driver of, of the growth, uh, because I happen to have another data set from the FAA here about on-time arrival statistics. Um, and it is, you know, this kind of uh, categorical data you would expect, origin city, destination city, flight date, um, you know, th that sort of thing. And then quantitative data like uh, arrival, arrival delay um, and, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of other, other statistics collected and uh, the number, number of flights. And I can drag out the number of flights. And the interesting thing about this data set is that it's, um, much, uh, it's a much bigger data set than the previous one. It's 168 million rows. Um, back in the day, we would have had to put that into a, a hot database engine like a Microsoft SQL Server, but um, we've been at Tableau. We've been investing in uh, 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 fast uh, data uh, 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 computation engines, and running on my laptop here is a, a cool database called Hyper that has the following property, which is that when I grab flight date and drop it. Um, uh, you will see how quickly it's able to aggregate that 168 million do uh, 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 views up at the year level. Now, this is a salient feature, but we know already that, that that's an um, uh, incomplete year. Uh, but there are two other salient features. One of them is this drop here between 
and this is a hint, 2000 and 2001. And the other one is uh, this drop in um, 2007. And this one, of course, is uh, from 9-11. Uh, uh, and, um, and this one is actually from the recession. And this is the cool part is if I re-aggregate at the month level, you can clearly see there, there's September uh, 2001. And then here is August uh, uh, 2008. And this was uh, around the time when Lehman went bankrupt and commercial companies, these are, this is commercial flight data, commercial companies uh, stopped the, uh, many of their employees from flying at the time because it was a scary economic situation. Um, so let me go back to the year level because I wanna combine this data with the strikes data. Now, the, these two data sets are really hard to combine down at the road level It's because they're so different. One is the relentless march every, every day of commercial flights. And the other one is episodic bird strikes uh, that happen all the time. But aggregated up at the year level, it's, it's super easy to combine these two. Uh, notice the flight date of the strikes data set has got a little, a little lit up linking icon on it. Uh, that's because the, 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 the two fields have the same name. And that allows me to drag and drop um, the, uh, the strikes. So strikes is in, bl in blue and the flights is in orange. And if it had only been this narrow interval, we might have thought they were correlated, but they're definitely not correlated. Um, the, the, the strikes is growing, whereas the flights, flights are uh, staying, staying flat. Uh, and of course, you know, there's, there's dips and all sorts of things here. So, so there's, um, they're, they're not correlated. So it probably is uh, more, more reporting and therefore it's probably safe to fly. So, um, so that kind of user experience for having the first kind of conversation with data uh, uh, between you and the computer, um, ha you know, if, it, if you can have a, you know, conversation like that, then one of the benefits of it is, is that uh, you can get insights uh, about your data and those insights can be valuable. Um, and that's absolutely true. And we've even had people at Tableau uh, trial Tableau get insights that have paid for all their subsequent purchase. But the, it, when I go out and talk to customers, the real value of, of, of that kind of user experience is, uh, is the time it saves. And if you think about it, time is absolutely the most valuable thing we all have. Uh, and in particular, for the skilled people in the organization, um, the, the kind of projects they do uh, they, uh, you know, if they have good tools for them, they can do a project that in one month that would have uh, pre pre those good tools taken six months. And the other kind of, of, of time benefit is that there are there's small problems that people can work on that uh, without a good tool for working with the data, they might have just uh, gone with their gut as opposed to using data to, to check their gut. And, uh, but a lightweight tool allows people, people to actually uh, use, use the data for that. So I'm gonna, I wanna come back to the, the cycle of visual analysis uh, as sort of a roadmap slide, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, dive into um, what I promised, which is that visually encoding data is really important for both kinds of analytical conversations. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna take this cycle and I'm going to unwrap it. Um, and so here over here is the task. And um, this is uh, an unwrapped version of that cycle is what is what is now called sort of the standard pipeline for working with data. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, working with data really is that cycle, but with the backtracking. But this is these are the sort of the basic steps of working with data. A person has some tasks. They have some raw data that they can transform form into a data table. Uh, they can take the, the data from that table and uh, map it visually to uh, various vis visual tools. And then uh, they can uh, uh, transform the, the visuals. Uh, uh, so, so there's visual transformations. And the human can control uh, all of these parts of, 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 the, of the pipeline. 
Now this pipeline comes from this book here that I uh, was able to be co-author with, with uh, Stu Card and Ben Schneiderman. And um, it uh, you know, has a bunch of uh, readings of, of academic literature and the reference model is based on those readings and a bunch more. It is a very descriptive of all of those user different kinds of both research and also commercial user experiences applies to Tableau as, as well, although uh, it, this was pretty much created before Tableau uh, happened um, as, as a reference model. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill into the, this part, the, the, the mapping from data tables to visual structures, because being able to do that is what takes the data and makes it be something that humans can work with re really, really effectively. And um, the, the, the most, probably the most seminal book that was written about this, this kind of mapping is a book that was written by Jacques Bertin called The Semiology of Graphics. Uh, and um, it, he, Jacques, notice the book publishing date, uh, uh, 1967. Jacques, uh, which was pretty much before you could use computers, but Jacques had a tremendous um, artistic eye and worked with data for a very long time. And this codifies a lot of uh, the, the knowledge he had about uh, wor working effectively with data. And in particular, um, he, he had a very linguistic approach to working with data, including, uh, this is my slide, of his um, uh, graphical vocabulary. And what Jacques points out in his book is that um, there are marks and then there are the properties of those marks, and you can use that to encode data. And so th there are three basic kinds of marks, points, lines, and areas. Uh, uh, position is super useful and super valuable, and there's two kinds of position for encoding data, Cartesian and polar. And then there's the uh, what Jock called retinal properties, and in particular he identified these six, color, size, shape, gray uh, level, orientation, and texture. And all of these six uh, are, um, you know, perceptual psychologists uh, tell us that we have uh, machinery in our in our visual cortex for processing this uh, these uh, retinal properties really uh, really quickly and so they're really useful for for working with data. So I used uh, Jacques' dissertation in my dissertation from Stanford, uh, and the title of that was Automatic Design of Gra Graphical Presentations, and I uh, picked up from him the sort of the his linguistic approach to uh, working with data visually. And here's you know page 33 out of my dissertation. Uh, notice that this the, these marks positioned on this axis, I called it a horizontal position sentence. And what I did, I, my goal in my dissertation was to um, uh, have a computer program that would rec uh, d explore the design space of graphical encodings of data and, and make recommendations about them. And so I, I needed to formalize what what Jock was doing. And so in particular, this, this uh, here, this is a database relation because I had a computer science background. Uh, and in particular, this particular relation up here is uh, the pr uh, price of cars uh, to their currency. Um, and then down here, I was using logic programming technologies uh, to, 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 build, to, to build up my system. This is a logic predicate uh, that describes how this sentence encodes data and a, a bunch of those predicates could be used to, to, to build a computer program that reasoned about using data. The other thing that I did um, in my dissertation is um, sort of peering into uh, Bertan's book is I codified three algebraic operators that allowed for a really broad search space, a single axis composition, double axis composition, and mark composition. And this uh, composition algebra gave the computer program the, uh, the ability to search for, 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 for effective. Um, and there's more I could talk about here, but I don't have time. Um, so I want to go on to uh, sort of the, how my work uh, fed into the work that ended up being Tableau. And in particular, 
it fed directly into Chris Stolte's dissertation. Chris Stolte's the guy here in the middle. Um, he's flanked on either side by the, the, the other two Tableau founders. Um, uh, on the left is uh, Christian Chabot, who was our brilliant CEO. And on the right-hand side is Pat Hanrahan. And Pat is still a full professor at Stanford and was uh, Chris's dissertation professor. Um, there are a bunch of patents, but the interesting part about Tableau is that it was the combination of computer graphics, human computer interaction and databases. Pat is extremely well known in computer graphics. Uh, he was one of the early employees at Pixar, uh, did a domain specific language there called RenderMan, got a couple of Academy Awards for that, that, that technology. Um, so that's where the computer graphics comes from. Uh, the human computer interaction and, uh, and databases came from Chris. He's a very skilled uh, uh, designer and also has more, more chops than I do in the area of databases. So I, I draw three arrows here because imagine these three things sort of coming at each other and then exploding back outward. Uh, and, that, and that led to, to the success that, that was Tableau. Now, the, it, the core of Tableau is on this slide. And in particular, it's here. It's the, it's the, it's the specification. Um, Chris and Pat in, uh, invented a domain specific language um, that combined both uh, query of databases as well as a graphical specification at the same time. The, the domain specific language is called VizQL and it leads to this lovely uh, cycle, this, which is super important uh, uh, from a usability point of view, where you, you, you query, the, you have query the database, uh, then you can assemble the results uh, into a graphical view. Uh, a person can then do drag and drop, and, uh, which leads to a new uh, 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 sentence in the, in the VizQL uh, domain specific language, and then you go around the cycle and, 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 that, and that's, you've already seen me demo that. So what I thought I'd do is show you how that, how the, the, that works. So here you have uh, uh, a drop of field, the number of strikes on the row shelf, and this is the sentence in the domain specific language uh, uh, for that. Uh, and if you drop a different field, on the row shelf, amount of damage uh, as a categorical, then you get a different, uh, with this very similar expression, you get a, 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 a different uh, view. And this is because Tableau knows the difference between quantitative and categorical fields. In fact, there's a type system inside that, it, that is used to interpret the domain specific la language. So here's categorical, quantitative, you have nominal, ordinal, temporal, for quantitative or geographic. Um, and so uh, that, that's a bunch of knowledge. That's what makes the language terse and, and, and easy for people to use. Um, if you drop two fields on it, uh, you get this lovely bar chart, which you have, you've already seen an earlier version of it. But uh, notice that it's a bar chart. Uh, the domain specific language would allow you to, to say, I want the marks as bars. But if you exclude that, then it, it will uh, still, it has rules in it about what are, what are effective ways to encode data. And in fact, uh, it uh, knows about, um, uh, 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 Chris's dissertation knew about tables, Gantt charts, uh, 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 trend lines, um, you know, maps, scatter plots, and dot plots. Uh, and these, are, these have the, the various properties along those lines. Um, so, um, so that, that's how, how it goes. And, and as a result, when you drag out different things, uh, you're making very similar expressions in the, in the language and you're getting different types of views depending on what you, what you dragged out. So um, the, um, the, 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 the language also has algebraic operators in it. Uh, this is where my thesis uh, really, really contribute to it. One of the operators is this plus operator here, and this is the the concatenate operator. This uh, gets uh, to to the small multiple view uh, where you have you where you have the dual dual columns here, and there's also a cross operator here, uh, 
um, that uh, allows for this kind of nesting to happen as well. So you can build up uh, rich, rich tables of graphics uh, you, use, using the operators from, from VizQL. So the, uh, as I mentioned before, the other thing about uh, VizQL that's really powerful is that you can use it, not only does it do graphical uh, specification, but it also do, uh, can be used to, do, to generate queries onto a database. And so here, 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 these fields is gets to that VizQL expression, and then uh, it's used to compile into this chunk of SQL here that then pulls the data that actually build, build, builds that view there. Um, you put out different fields, and you end up with a larger chunk of SQL um, to 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 get uh, to get that value, and then of course. Uh, you can build even richer and more complicated views and get even larger chunks of, of SQL. And the interesting thing about the domain-specific language is that it also can be used to write um, um, uh, the, the language for a cube database as well, so, which is uh, MDX, completely different language uh, from, from, from SQL. And the, of course, what, what this does is it leads to a user experience that uh, allows you to sort of really whip through your data. And the key thing there from a human computer interaction point of view is the, both the immediate feedback you get uh, as, as you do the various operations and also the in incremental construction of more complicated views. That's just how people work. The, the immediate feedback helps people uh, find their way into the data, and then the, then uh, the incremental construction allows them to build richer and richer views of their data. Um, the the technology also ha uses uh, smart defaults uh, to uh, uh, to uh, speed you on, keep you in the flow of visual analysis. So, for example, uh, you just turn on forecasting, and it there's a bunch of smarts there about. Um, you know, what interval to, to do it, uh, choices of colors and, 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 and things like that. All sorts of, all, all sorts of smart defaults in the, in the application. So um, yeah, so that was my deep dive into the sort of the, the, the crux of this is the ability to take the data from tables and map them to a visual structure and then wrap, wrap that into a user experience that Allow, allows uh, people to, to explore their data. Um, now I'm gonna go back to the full reference model because there's a lot more here that can be talked about. Um, there is a lot to be talked about uh, on the data side of it, uh, both how, how to get from raw data uh, to data tables and the other issue on the data side that's super important is that the amount of data in the world is growing uh, 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 exponentially and so data performance ha is a really big issue to deal with. And in fact, it has super usability issues. So you, you don't get immediate feedback uh, uh, when, when the data is really, really massive. And, and there are all sorts of ways to deal with that. Um, and of course, there's a lot more to, that could be talked about on the, the view transformation side, on the, on the uh, uh, user interface side. But I'm going to try and, and go to the second half of talking, uh, of talking about the second type of analytical conversation. And to do that, I wrapped up the reference model back into the cycle, because when you, when you see the, the, visual, uh, the cycle of visual analysis, you'll notice that the act part here has sharing. And sharing, it, what sharing is, is um, actually having conversations with others around data. And that's absolutely essential for working with on the, on the biggest problems in the world. And um, it is, in fact, that sharing, those, the, those conversations with others um, uh, leading to decisions and then actual actions uh, is what actually drives impact for, of data in the world and makes progress on the big problems. And uh, for that sharing, I'm going to recommend this book by Hans Rosling called Factfulness. Um, Hans is a super interesting person uh, he was uh, he was raised in Sweden. Uh, he studied to be a doctor, and then he wanted to do good in the world. And he went off to Africa, and discovered in Africa that in fact he didn't 
the, what he had been told in school about Africa wasn't really what he found on the ground. And he gathered up a bunch of UN uh, statistics data and started telling stories with data um, uh, about, about the world, about how the world was different than, than, than most people had been taught. This is a picture of him. He was a really good teller of story. This is a picture of him at the uh, Tableau Customer Conference in London that I got to attend. Um, and he's using sort of the Socratic method um, and asking, well, where do the 7 billion people live? Uh, you know, A, B, or C. And he has this amazing pointer uh, to make to make the sort of the interact the live interactions with data uh, uh, more in in interactive, um, uh, more engaging, um, and the cool thing about his book Factfulness is that not only do you hear the story that he told about data, but he codifies what he learned over the thirty years uh, 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 into a set of uh, uh, guidelines and rules of thumb that you can use uh, or that anyone can use. Uh, to to uh, 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 tell tell stories with data, to have better conversations with data, and this is Hans's slide. Um, what Hans uh, in the in the book says is that there are ten dramatic instincts that people have, just inherently have, that limit the impact of data. Uh, dramatic because, in particular, he was really interested in. Um, people tend to go to the extremal points. So when he got to Africa, he found it was out, it was much more nuanced than, than he had been taught in school. He was taught that Africa was a poor country. That was extreme, extremal point. Um, I don't have time to talk about all 10 of these, but I want to mention this one. What single is, is essentially, I will call it confirmation bias. Uh, 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 confirmation bias is a bias where we think we know what's going on and we go look for confirmatory evidence for that. Um, and it's like the interesting thing about confirmation bias is the smarter you are, the harder you fall for this one because the easier it is to come up with confir confir confirmatory evidence for, for whatever thing you think is working on it. And what Hans recommends is, you know, locate the middle uh, or for confirmation bias, um, you know, explore multiple hypotheses, which is why I, in my demo, I did not only looked at more reporting, but also looked at more, more, more flights, uh, because that, that's what you need to do to, to uh, uh, protect yourself from confirmation bias. So this is um, uh, my diagram about data stories that I took away after reading uh, Hans's book and thinking about it uh, fairly deeply, which is that what data stories have that's special compared to most stories, humans are, tell stories all the time, is that they include logical steps based upon the data. So this is a simple schematic of, uh, of a data story. It's, there's some sort of setup of problem or question. Then you go through a sequence of logical steps that lead to a finding or a conclusion of, of some kind. And what I'm going to do here is just to give you a little, uh, you know, on the uh, little sense of how technology can help by uh, doing a demo of how animation can help with the with uh, with the with the logical steps in the data story. Um, and animation can be really useful uh, in a data story. Uh, first of all, it can make the steps visceral, which is to say, wake up the audience, and I hope to wake you up. Um, uh, by by doing my demo, it can also show what changed and what stayed the same, and that's super useful. Um, it can also, by the way, draw your attention to what changed and what stayed the same. And then finally, it can actually illustrate the the logic of the step. Um, but I will warn you that words are still absolutely essential in stories. Um, so you sort of what you should do is you should uh, say what the logical step is, then you can animate and, and illustrate it. And then sometimes it's best to, 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 uh, uh, to uh, say it again. So I'm going to go back into Tableau and um, here's a little story I authored about how bird strikes and migration are related to each other and that you should care about it. Um, and I'm going to take advantage. So the first step in the story was, was to describe the data set, but I already did describe the data set for you. So I'll go on to the next step. Um, 
And so here, and, and I'm going to take advantage also of, you know, here's the uh, years over time and number of strikes. And this data is aggregated up at the year level, but I'm, but I'm going to re-aggregate or change the aggregation to month level. And so um, that, that, that is that transformation that I just did logically. And you already can start to see that, that migration is, is important here. Uh, you can see it even more if I uh, adjust uh, the data to put all the Januaries um, uh, ne next to each other. And so you can see that there are more, more, more reports in the summertime, wintertime. What's super interesting though, is uh, to, to look here in May and June, there's something going on here that's super interesting. Um, and um, in fact, if you take all the years and, com and combine them together, um, you can definitely see that there's a, that even with that aggregation, that there's something super interesting going on in May and June. So I want you to focus on that. And in particular, um, birds migrate at altitude. So um, I'm going to take this line and break it apart uh, and pull out all the, all the bird strikes uh, that, are, that were reported above a thousand feet. Um, and so uh, when I do that, this orange line here, now we actually see both humps of migration. Uh, they're, they migrate in one direction in the spring and migrate back in the other direction <coughs> in the fall. And we can also, by the way, see here that the, the, the data that was left over, which is to say um, the, the, the data uh, below 1,000 feet and also the data where we didn't know the elevation, probably also have a little bit of migra migrating data in it. And of course, this data set is fun because it's, it's actually not completely clean. Um, now, uh, why should you care about migration and bird strikes? Well, what I did is I've taken the data here and binned it up by 1,000 foot elevation. And I've got a very crude depiction of uh, Mount Rainier, which is right outside where I live, um, which is 14,000 feet high, because I'm just trying to get you to understand uh, that this is 14,000 feet here. And the reason why you should care about um, birds by migration and bird strikes at altitude is because I'm going to switch from the number of strikes to the cost, average cost. And when I do that, um, the, uh, the, as you can see, the average cost at each of these bin levels is, is much larger than below a thousand feet. So it turns out that, um, that bird strikes at altitude are, are more, are more expensive. Um, I also uh, wanted to show the power of uh, using animation for sorting. Um, and so, so, so this particular view is here about that. So it shows you know, the correlation or non-correlation of um, elevation, average cost, and, and, and number of strikes. And this is the end of my story. And here is um, the miracle on the Hudson. And as you can see, the miracle on the Hudson is both uh, above a thousand feet and also uh, the most expensive um, uh, uh, report in the, in, in the database because uh, essentially the plane was effectively destroyed. Um, so how are we doing on time? Uh, you are just about perfect, uh, Jock. I mean, it, it's 7.58, so officially we have two more minutes, but really we're pretty loose in terms of exactly when we finish. Okay, awesome. Um, good. I, I will, I will, I, I want to do a, a sort of one uh, fi final part about this. Um, interesting. I, I clicked the wrong button, but I'm going to keep going. Um, so that was the animation demo. And now I want to just dive in just briefly into one of these uh, big problems that we're dealing with, um, at, uh, which is the climate. And um, the, the, the climate um, crisis is a problem where data is going to be absolutely uh, essential for, for addressing, making progress on it even, um, both kinds of conversations with computers and also between people. Um, I'm going to uh, recommend that you go watch, if you haven't already, David Attenborough's uh, um, 
most recent film, A Life on Our Planet. Uh, this is, um, he, he calls it his witness statement. Uh, and it, 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 it's very sobering. It presents a lot of valuable data about the climate crisis. And it also includes some of his thoughts about how, how to deal with the climate crisis. Um, but it's going to take all of our involvement. We've, we've meddled with the planet for, um, you know, for many generations. And uh, we're, so, we're so embroiled in, in, in our meddling that we're going to have to get involved even more uh, with, with the planet. And to do that, we're going to uh, both need to get more data about, about the climate and actually also um, you know, uh, get involved everywhere in the world on trying to mitigate the, the problems that we've, all, that we've already started. And so I mostly am going to just talk briefly about sort of getting, getting data, although it can, there's also a little hint of mi mitigation here. Um, so the first thing I did for this talk was I went off and discovered that there was a, a group that uses drones to gather, conservation drones is what it's called, to gather up data about the world and to, you know, to solve particular problems. So this, there are these two gentlemen down here have flown this drone up so that they can see uh, that this particular osprey nest on top of this telephone pole actually has eggs in it uh, so that they can then, uh, you know, worry about uh, whether, you know, whether the, the, the osprey is going to uh, do, do all right and, and mitigate some of the things. Um, and then I found out um, that uh, uh, her, there was a story in the newspaper that uh, was local to, to Washington State. And it led me to this um, graduate student at the University of Washington. Um, and he's been working in the, his, for his dissertation work, uh, he's been working in the area of building really small sensors. And he applied the small sensors to uh, murder hornets. And this here is a murder hornet. And what they're called murder hornets because they kill honeybees. And so they're really, they're really serious, uh, a serious problem. And murder hornets uh, um, ha have shown up in Washington state. Uh, and this is showing him uh, using a piece of dental floss to attach one of his little itty bitty sensors onto, onto this live murder hornet, um, which he's uh, then going to let go so they can fly back so they can find, find the hive. Here's the, uh, the, a murder hornet on an apple tree. Those are apples, the red things are apples, um, uh, with, with the sensor on them. And what the newspaper article uh, that led me to these images uh, was, was that they actually succeeded in finding the hive and they were able to capture the entire hive uh, which was a really good thing because one of the nasty things about murder hornets is that they have lots of queens and so they can propagate uh, really, really uh, well. Uh, and the battle is not over yet, but they were able to, to deal with that particular hive. Um, and so that's just the beginning of the amount of meddling that we're going to have to do. And it's going to have to be data, uh, data driven uh, uh, engagement with uh, mitigating the climate crisis. So thank you very much.